or before, but uh, max will be 7.30. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Welch, director of the Bonnie and Bill Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communication at Shepherd University. On behalf of President Mary Hendricks, the Institute's Board of Advisors, and the entire Shepherd University community, we welcome you to our latest installment of the American Conversation series, Freedom of Speech, Censorship, and the Cancel Culture, Social Media and Politics in Today's America. We believe this is a timely and important forum as we present a cross-collaboration among social media educators and experts aimed at providing a true learning experience for our audience. If you have questions, please submit them via Zoom chat function and we will try to get to them. Our panelists for tonight's American Conversation series include Dr. Patricia alder Haida. She's a professor of communication in the School of Communication at American University in Washington, D.C. She holds a BA, MA, and PhD in history from the University of Minnesota. She founded the School Center for Media, that is the American University School Center for Media and Social Impact, where she continues as a senior research fellow. Her books include Reclaiming Fair Use, How to Put Balance Back in Copyright, Beyond PC, Toward a Politics of Understanding, and several other books as well. Dr. Ofter Haida has twice been a Fulbright Research Fellow and has served as a juror at the Sundance Film Festival. I was most impressed with that, Patricia, by the way. Dr. David Karp is an Associate Professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. His work focuses on strategic communication practices of political associations in America with a particular interest in internet-related strategies. Dr. Karp is the award-winning author of The Move On Effect, The Unexpected Transformation of American Political Advocacy and Analytic Activism, Digital Listening and the New Political Strategy. Both books discuss how digital media is transforming the work of political advocacy and activist organizations. Dr. Matthew Matt Cushion is a professor in the Department of Mass Communication here at Shepherd University and a senior fellow in the Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communication. He specializes in helping social media educators teach confident in today's digital landscape. He is the author of the book, Teach Social Media, a plan for creating a course your students will love and writes Social Media Syllabus, a popular blog and resource tool for social media educators. Dr. Cushion's research focuses on social media, politics, and civic life. Our moderator for tonight's forum is Amanda Carpenter. Amanda is the director of Republicans for Voting Rights, a columnist for the Bulwark, for the Bulwark and a CNN contributor. She is the author of Gaslighting America, Why We Love It When Trump Lies to Us. Previously, she served as speechwriter to South Carolina Senator Jim DeMent, and communications director to Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Amanda, with that, I bow out and leave the rest to you. Thank you all for your time and participation in tonight's American Conversation Series. Well, thank you, David, for putting together this wonderful and timely event. There has been um, a lot of really amazing reporting on what's going on in the most known social media platform, which is Facebook this week. But this is such a broad and important topic um, that I'm glad to have this opportunity to explore with these great panelists um, a few things I'm really interested in. Uh, namely, just what even, what is social media? How is it changing our politics and how we talk with each other? What is going on with all this cancel culture stuff? And how are we grappling with it all just as people, um, as, as governing bodies, if at all? And so I, I want to invite each of our panelists to just give an overview of the biggest things they seem happening that they're studying um, that are impacting this field. And I, I'd like to introduce, uh, have ladies go first. Um, so we'll have Dr. Offer Off Heidel go first. And then I would invite Dr. Karf to speak. And then we'll go back with the hometown hitter, uh, Dr. Cushion, if we will. So thank you very much. Uh, I think everybody who is on Twitter or Facebook uh, or Twitch or uh, another one of these network platforms is pretty familiar with what uh, social media are. And I think we've, we've moved from an era in which people were like, wow, this is really great. You know, I can, I can find all these people. This has gotta be like 
like really enabling of so much uh, good stuff, people connecting with each other. You know, remember Facebook is all about connection. And, uh, you know, look at all these social movements that, that, that uh, these social platforms enabled. Look at how important these platforms were to the Arab Spring, although later evidence suggests maybe not so much. But um, there, was, there was, I think, a lot of popular enthusiasm that underneath that enthusiasm, there was um, running your very, very typical uh, moral panic around what does it mean that my kids are on Facebook all the time? What does it mean that, um, you know, my, 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 everybody want, all my kids want a cell phone. It's always about the children. What about the children? So those two things I think were going on for a long time until we saw tech clash. Uh, you know, the, the disillusionment with surve general surveillance. So um, both of <laughs> the, the, the network properties that so charmed the general public at the beginning um, became, we became aware of the fact that somebody's running that network and somebody's watching that network. And so surveillance and all of the issues that come with it have become very big. I'm turning it over to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, Dave. Um, to be clear, I do not know more of, the, of what I'm talking about than you do, but I'll, I'll happily chime in. Um, what stands out to me about social media, similarly, I would, I would periodize it, that we had Web 1.0 in the 1990s in the 2000s, the aughts, we had Web 2.0. Uh, when you think Web 2.0, think like the blogosphere, early YouTube, Wikipedia. Uh, and then it's in the 2010s that we really arrive at the social media era. You know, Twitter and Facebook came up during the Web 2.0 era, but they as platforms became how we engage with the internet really in the 2010s. And they're now where so much of our activity is based. So it's not, when we talk about social media, we are talking really about Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. It is a handful of platforms controlled by a handful of companies. And as our internet use has moved towards those platforms, our concerns have gotten concentrated with them as well, right? So we're worried about algorithms now in a way that we weren't worried 10, 15 years ago, because with everything, everything concentrated on Facebook, there's this question of how is Facebook sorting through all of your network's content and what are they delivering to you? And what we've seen in the past week of reporting is they know a lot more about what they're delivering to you than we do. Most of it is not great, which is why they've kept it hidden. Um, and then on the question of the cancel culture, what stands out to me is I, I'm a bit of a skeptic. I'm not actually sure that cancel culture is a unique thing. It strikes me that it is largely the political or incorrectness moral panic that we had in the 1990s. When I was in college, we were worried about political correctness. And you take that same set of concerns and add it to diff slightly different social behaviors that are going on through social media. And you have basically the same thing, but I, I'm not sure that it's really necessarily a new thing or the growing threat that it's often made out to be. Dr. Christian. Um, I'd just like to echo a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. When I think about what social media is, um, in my courses, we've talked through web 1.0 and web 2.0. And when we talk about social media, I always use the analogy of a playground. So um, let's think, you know, Facebook or Twitter created, you know, sort of slides and, uh, you know, ladder and, and these types of things. In other words, they created a structure that people can interact with and play with. And, you know, in other words, you can run up the slide, you can go down the slide, you can go fast, you can go slow. And I think just like a playground, it was a lot of fun um, when, we, when we all started playing on it. And I think over time, um, just like a lot of things that happen, happen in a schoolyard playground, there have been actors, people who have come in and, you know, quote unquote, sort of bullied or, or acted in ways to, um, uh, that may have uh, pushed some people aside or made people feel marginalized through the actions of those who are very loud. Um, and there isn't uh, oversight that some people would, would think would be of, of benefit to have a level of oversight. In other words, in this analogy of sort of the, the teachers or you know, sort of step away from the playground and aren't paying attention, um, you know, to kind of bring that analogy around. Some of us may feel that regulation is necessary um, by the government to kind of wrangle in some of these things. So um, everything that was said um, was, was excellent. I just 
kind of trying to maybe add that layer to it as a, a different way of kind of thinking about what's been said. Yeah, I really like that idea of um, viewing social media as a playground because I want to stay on this subject of the structure of social media. Because while I think that, of course, everyone first thinks of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube as social media, um, the mentality of social media really is per pervasive in the way that so much media now is designed to engage the user. Um, and I was just wondering what you think that does to discourse when instead of consuming media, you are incentivized to engage with it. And I'll leave that to whoever may want to take that. I'll take a first shot. I, what stands out to me is I, I think it's useful to always follow the money so that you can follow the incentives, right? There is what our behavior on, what, what behaviors Facebook is encouraging from the users. And there's also what behaviors Facebook is encouraging from news outlets, right? Because it's been several years now, I mean, dating back at least to 2013, that in order to get clicks, you need to have headlines that fit Facebook. A decade before that, or say eight years before that, in order to get clicks, you needed headlines that fit Google. That's one of the ways that we've moved from say Google's era to Facebook's era. And that, get, that gives you different headline behaviors. And that also leads to newsrooms having through, through their analytics, they're able to see what is performing really well on Facebook, what's performing really well on Twitter and what doesn't perform well on those sites. That then creates different newsroom behaviors. That leads to different stories becoming the story they wanna cover. Um, I mean dating back all the way to, to 2015 and early 2016, one of the advantages that Donald Trump clearly had in the Republican primary was he got the attention through media by being very good, you know, a reality TV star who was very good at capturing media. Other, his Republican opponents kept on waiting for that attention to let up, to go to somebody else. And it never did because all these news organizations could through, see through their social media analytics just how much more popular their Donald Trump stories were than any other stories. You know, Rubio, Bush, Cruz, all legitimate candidates kept on waiting for the moment when the news media would turn to them and it never came. And that's not so much about user behavior, end users, you know, you and me, that's about the news organizations shifting their coverage because of what they can see is incentivized through the social media organizations. So would you, would you the panelists agree or disagree with the fact that traditional news coverage now follows what dominates on social media? I would certainly agree with that. Uh, you know, what's going on on Reddit, what's going on on Twitter, what's going on on Facebook. I think that, um, you know, as Dave mentioned, everything is incentivized through likes, you know, engagement, follower counts, these sorts of things. And if you're incentivized to, you know, drive traffic to an ad generating, or an, excuse me, a website that generates its revenue through advertisements, then you have to follow trends. And in, I, you know, I think back to when Twitter added sort of that trending column on the right, uh, or at least it was on the right at the time, right? We can sort of see trending topics. So that's obviously gonna drive clicks to Wall Street Journal, you know, wherever it is. Absolutely, you have to respond to the environment that you're playing in. Mm -hmm. But that, Dr. After Heide, I just let me pose this. Who do you think is responsible? Is it the companies? Because they're really just letting people click what they want, correct? Let me let me complicate this before we take up that topic. <laughs> Please. Um first of all, um I think we actually have some really good evidence from this, the work that Yochai Benkler and his colleagues did uh, at MIT for a book called Network Propaganda of the importance, the absolute importance of mass media in social media circulation because of the, of the overwhelming, the driver of all of these uh, shares and clicks is most typically some kind of mass media. And in that mass media, the, 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 um, the organization that is most adept at doing this is Fox which operates in a kind of, un, unlike, the, unlike the, the other networks, operates in a closed, opinion-rich, emotion-rich, and fact-free environment, and fact-checked free environment. People who are in that environment are not even interested in checking facts. Um, and that is a wonderful environment for, um, 
uh, social, viral social media for people to be outraged and fascinated and share a lot of stuff. So I don't want us to throw away mass media. That said, trying to address your most recent point, um, Facebook recently uh, um, deliberately lowered the amount of news from mass media sources uh, that you were going to get and upped the news from your friends and family. Mm -hmm. And what this did was to prioritize Facebook's own provision of information, including information that other people would post and increase that circulation in trusted networks. And what that has done is to massively increase known misinformation, particularly around vaccines. Uh, so the underlining what both of my colleagues have said, super important to follow the money because uh, Facebook is only interested in engagement in order to up its advertising and make its advertising, uh, make it a non-negotiable place you must be. Google and Facebook dominate the advertising market at this point. So, so they will do what they, what they have to do to do that. And what they're doing is writing algorithms, that is to say basic recipes that encourage you, that, that, uh, that determine what you're going to get in your feed. So you might have this great sense of control over what you're doing and looking, but actually you're, um, you're performing uh, within a set of expectations that Facebook's recipe, its algorithms, has already written for you. I feel like every time I open my mouth, I'm, I'm uttering some generality that deserves like three little conditions. So <laughs> pardon me for that. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems to be a problem that the algorithm is so secret. Do, do you guys agree with that? Should it, should it be kept secret for how they are choosing to privilege certain information that is shown to users? Is it, is it even possible for a user to navigate um, the content that they're getting, or is it just served up to them? So I, I'm reminded of a thing I tell my students at the beginning of every semester, which is the answer to every question I will ask them is, well, it's complicated. <laughs> yes. And to not put that on the exam, because that's too clever by half. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I think it's interesting, co interestingly complicated in the following way. Um, I, I, in my 2016 book, I talked about a principle of approximate transparency. I don't think that they should be fully transparent about their algorithmic recipes because there is enough money in this system to attract bad actors who will try to game the system. If you are 100% clear on what one needs to do to get top billing in Google search results or in the Facebook newsfeed, then there will be a lot of money. There, there, there will be a, a race to game that and get the most money out of it. So for that reason, they need to be at least somewhat opaque in what their algorithm is. Um, but what Facebook in particular has been terrible about is working with independent researchers. They can be approximately transparent in what their algorithmic, algorithmic recipe is and still be more open with their data so that independent researchers can be analyzing their effects, their harms, what they produce. Um, and Facebook in particular has been atrocious with independent researchers. There was a story just last month, uh, the NYU Ad Observatory uh, is a research project studying Facebook's data. And when Facebook noticed that they were doing research on Facebook and producing research that wasn't in Facebook's corporate interest, Facebook just shut them down. Um, that type of stuff is an outrage. I, I understand why they need approximate transparency, but they also need to be engaged enough with independent researchers that there can be checks and the public and public officials can have some understanding of their effects that is not just coming from corporate PR. What do you think, Dr. Cushion? Should, does Facebook need to be more transparent? I mean, it's their platform, it's their property. Nobody is forced to go on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. It's all voluntary, correct? It's voluntary. And you could argue that people are addicted to it. Um, you know, so whether or not it's it's voluntary, um, you know, brings on a whole new meaning. But I do think that no one's going to give up the secret recipe. You know, there was there were commercials 
10, 15 years ago of a, a guy and he had this, this recipe and his dog was the only one that knew it. And it was, the joke was sort of the dog isn't going to tell. That's the secret recipe that is going to delineate Facebook from Twitter, uh, from you know the other competitor. And all of them are in a race to get you to stay on the platform as long as possible. I do think that, um, you know, with that said, I agree with Dave. Th there needs to be a level of transparency, but I think that they're doing that in the sense of this is how you play our platform to grow your audience. So if you think of, you know, search engine optimization, which people tend to think about Google, there's an entire industry there, right? Built around how do I figure out how to get my page, you know, to show up at the, the top of search results. YouTube, Facebook, uh, et cetera, teach you, you know, the, the user, the product, how to use it to get more people to pay attention to, you know, your YouTube page or, or whatever, whatever it is. And so in educating us, they are providing those cues and they do put out information that does speak to, these are approximately the factors, but I don't think that they would be under any, you know, be willing to or, or happily give that information away because it not only does bad actors, does it empower them, their competition in the marketplace, Twitter and so forth, um, you know, it just certainly wouldn't be to their benefit. If we think of Twitter, it used to be simply chronological, right? And they borrowed a, a, the playbook of Facebook and said, okay, well, let's start dishing up to people as they sort of scroll down the next piece of content to keep them in and the next piece of content in the ad. And a lot of us might prefer the way it was when it was chronological, but the reality is what works is you know the algorithm that they're constantly tweaking and, and evolving. So uh, I think you know in, in regulatory studies we spend a, a lot of time pointing out that th there's different uh, powers and capacities between content regulation and structural regulation, and. In, in, discussing, in discussing social media platforms, I think one thing that pretty much everybody, Democrats, Republicans, um, people who are entirely apolitical, um, little old ladies like me and my students, they, they could all agree is this thing is out of control. This is the wild west. Things are happening that, that we just, uh, cannot like what stomach i think swatting is a really great example uh you know when people are um are focused on by somebody who doesn't like them and that person is able to use enough information from these network uh platforms to identify where they are and call the local police and say you know he uh, th this guy has is is going to kill his daughter uh, you know, send the SWAT team, which is regarded as funny by some people and it has had deadly consequences. And uh, so there, there's, there's you know, extremely, there are things that alarm people about being public. And, uh, you know, the, the alternative to um, uh, sharing your information on these platforms, unfortunately, is not. I don't have to be on those platforms. There's a very famous case of a of a woman who was pregnant and did not want her pregnancy to be exploited by commercial interests, and so went off all uh, social media platforms and was then uh, then paid a huge price in terms of being cut off from credit and basically recognized as a non-person, you know, and fell on fell into a category of a person of suspicion. So we we don't really have an option, and when our when our options are very, very, very limited. That means those companies are really, really, really big. So one structural regulatory approach is um, give people more options of places to be. But you know, the reason you're on Facebook is not because you just love Facebook. Lots of people are on Facebook because without liking it, they're on there because everybody else is too. Imagine if Facebook were required 
to be able to port your data and networks over to another platform if you wanted to switch. Okay, that's, that is a form of content regulation. Now, imagine you have structural regulation that makes network, that makes Facebook not the only game in town. And it is possible to start an alternative social media platform without Facebook buying you in the third round of venture capital. That's structural regulation. Um, there's sort of an interesting question we danced around. I, I think, you know, we all sort of agree, no one is making you go on Facebook or Twitter, but is it actually possible to opt out? Uh, Dr. Christian, I know you sent me an article in the Washington Post recently talking about this very problem. So I, I, I know you have been exploring the idea of whether it's even possible to live a social media free life, whether you are on that platform or not. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that um, Facebook works with data brokers to gather a great deal of information about each of us, whether we are using the platform actively or we are you know, completely deactivated or never created an, an account. Um, because again, Facebook is in the advertising business. Um, and so the more information or data points that they have about each of us, the better they're able to deliver ads. And you know, we also know that if you, you can go to a website that's off Facebook, right? And through a pixel, Facebook gathers data about you and sends that back to data, which is be back to Facebook, so that you know maybe in a month or a week you log in and they have that data about your activities, you know, both offline as well as uh, you know, just online, but not on Facebook. And Facebook's advertising network is similar to Google. You know, that you're not just seeing an ad from Facebook only when you're on Facebook or only when you're on Instagram. And the same is true for Google. You see an advertisement, you know, on YouTube, you see an advertisement through their partner networks, right? Where they have ad banners and so forth. I'm referring to Google now. Um, and so I don't think that it, in this moment in time is possible for you to be, to separate yourself from, let's just say Facebook because of the data brokers that they're working with to gather data, to build that, you know, that, that whole picture of you as an individual. So that again, so that they can have targeted ads and those, and they can predict that those ads will be successful. If you go into buy an advertisement on Instagram or you know on Facebook using the Facebook advertising platform, they can more or less guarantee how many people are going to see. I mean, there's some fluctuation. How many people are going to see your ad? How many people are you can optimize the advertisement for clicks? So they're going to show it to the sort of person that is likely to click on your advertisement. So they know enough about said person that that person is likely to click versus the person who's likely simply to see it. And they can optimize it for you know, the rate of exposure for a wider audience. And so it's, it's not just who's going to see it, but how are they going to interact with it? So um, I, I don't think there's a way to get away from it at this moment in time. Yeah, the, the thing I would add there is even if one could live as a social media hermit, and let's grant that it's possible, but it would be really hard. Um, the broader social impacts wouldn't go away. And again, this is where I think it's important not just to think about what can you and I do to be more or less tracked by social media, but instead to think about this, the range of intermediaries. Even if I stayed off of all social media, the news organizations that I would be watching on TV, since they know in order to reach the broader audience, they need to write things that play well on Facebook or you know, clips that are gonna do well on YouTube. Given that, that's still going to bend their coverage. And that means that what we need to be thinking about is, uh, is at least uh, competition regulation, right? Like when people have decided they wanted to get away from Facebook, often the place they'll go to is Instagram. Guess what? That's Facebook. It doesn't need to be Facebook, right? There's an alternate world in which uh, the government just decided, you know what? You don't actually get to buy up your competitors because if we're gonna have a marketplace, it would be nice to have a competitive marketplace. But Facebook has been allowed to buy WhatsApp. It's been allowed to buy uh, Instagram. It's been allowed to buy up smaller competitors so that they never compete. Google was allowed to buy DoubleClick. That, that gives them pretty much every step of the online advertising market, which allows those two companies to have such a huge footprint that every company that needs to reach people through them then has to bend to their wills. That means even if I can be a social media hermit, I don't escape the broader harms. 
And that to me says, if we're gonna have competition, if we're gonna have competition, we need to worry about monopoly. It seems to me that, you know, we're kind of getting into the conversation about whether Facebook should be broke up. Um, do, do you all agree with that sentiment or disagree? All right, hands up if you agree Facebook should be broken up. Okay. Come on, uh, come on. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, well, well, let's go with Dr. Afrahida. Why don't, why don't you explain? Because what's really interesting about the breaking up Facebook discussion to me is that there's a lot of people on the right and the left. I mean, you can get people from Donald Trump to Josh Hawley to Elizabeth Warren to Bernie Sanders, but they really all want to do it for different reasons. <laughs> and then you have someone like Joe Biden and says, eh, I don't know. Um, so go ahead and make your case, doctor. So I think Dave just made that case for me. I don't need to make a case that uh, not having any competition is a good idea for consumers, especially when these very large platforms, not just, not just Facebook, but Google and Amazon and Apple and Microsoft, when these companies are so big, on a worldwide basis that that they are the 800 pound gorilla they can they can sit wherever they want in your living room they can do they can do what they want to and as dave points out they they control the future of commerce they can fuel they 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 control the future of what one scholar calls a surveillance economy an economy that is is based on that new capacity for 360 degree surveillance, which, you know, every company is invested on, invested in, in one way or another. Um, I realized that Apple has a whole privacy thing, not going to go into that. Um, and the way in which they participate in the surveillance economy as well. But uh, you, you know, every, uh, everybody who buys a nest is everybody who, everybody who buys anything that is in the internet of things is contributing to the growth of this surveillance economy. When you have that new capacity and when you're offering services in what is known as a two-sided market, a market where uh, you're offering things to consumers, but you've also got another market there, which in this case is advertisers for Google and for Facebook, um, you can offer this stuff to consumers for free and free means that, that they are, their attention is exploited. So those characteristics are new in the world and they do require rethinking some you know, classic truisms. But if there is a classic truism of, of American economics pre 50 years ago, it was that competition is good. That was the basis of antitrust, which redesigned our economy, made it less uh, less likely to collapse and uh, created opportunities for all kinds of companies and jobs to be created. That, that era looks like it might be returning because there is public appetite for some control of out of control economic forces like these platforms. And there is a, an administration, the Biden administration, which is really committed to a revival of some basic antitrust principles. We have Lena Khan running the FTC. Lena Khan it has made very, very, very smart arguments about why traditional antitrust pro-competition arguments uh, need to be applied in a modern era. Uh, and you have new, a renewed interest in the DOJ. You have, um, the judiciary, there was a judgment recently at Epic v. Apple, uh, which challenged Apple's effective monopoly or monopolistic uh, control over, um, uh, over uh, uh, companies that need its app store. And the, the, judge, the ruling basically says, well, you know, aside from this one thing, we, we really can't rule against Apple because under the last 50 years of case law and legislation, it, 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 it's, it's still okay to be that, but it's not actually okay. We need legislation to fix this problem. So you have all three, 
uh, parts of government at the federal level being aware that the future of the American economy is now at stake and antitrust is a tool to do it. So yeah, I think breaking up Facebook is uh, something that we can expect to see as a serious, um, uh, as, as something that is seriously entertained. I, I think that there, there might be some, Never mind. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Dr. Coffin, let me put this to you. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies mentioned then that Apple, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, that kind of get lumped into this big tech discussion. Um, but what I'm kind of hearing from you guys is that maybe it's the potential for the surveillance to be misused. Um, I might offer that we haven't seen any significant harms from that yet. But if there is a concern about the surveillance, are we really talking about just breaking up any companies and regulating them because they have a lot of data? Or are there more reasons you're more interested in? Dr. Karp. Yeah. Um, I don't mind companies having data so long as it is their own data. What I would really like to shut down, if give me a magic wand, I want to shut down the data markets. Mm. What do you mean by oh, that? What I mean is, I don't mind Netflix having lots of data on my Netflix behavior to better serve Netflix properties to me. I don't even mind Amazon, which is, it is way too big, but Amazon having all of its data on what books I like to serve me and people like me other books, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I think the potential harms there are very small. Where we need to get really concerned is when they take my data profile and your data profile as products and sell and re resell them through a data broker industry that has been virtually unregulated from its beginning and has gotten way too large. That's where the, the harms that uh, we've been hearing about keep on magnifying because that's where the, there's a, a, at least a semi-famous case I've seen in a few books. Uh, there was a woman, I believe in Arkansas, um, whose name was similar to the name of somebody who had been arrested for selling meth. And her data profile got confused and said, she's the person who sold meth. And she then couldn't get jobs because people would run that data profile and it had gotten sold and resold through so many data brokers that when she found out about it, she couldn't get it fixed. That's a demonstrable harm based in error because these data profiles are noisy. Of course they are, it's an unregulated marketplace. Of course there's gonna be junk and noise in there. So Amazon, you get Amazon's data, you don't get anybody else's. Netflix, you can improve your, your services through Netflix data, you don't get anyone else's. Facebook you can offer Facebook advertising and Facebook products based on my behavior on Facebook. I still think we should break off Instagram so Instagram can be a competitor to Facebook, but then they can have all the data that we give to them, but they can't have anyone else's data. That would shut down a large unregulated market that is doing plenty of harms that we don't know about because again, this is dark data that is, un that is untracked and therefore independent researchers can't get at it. That's I think just a basic way to keep Americans safe and limit the harms here without actually harming any of the direct products. They get all the data that we give to them. Dr. Cushion, why are you not on the break it all up train? And are you concerned? I mean, should we have a right to control our own data online? Or when you press the button, do you do you waive all that? Um, I, I, uh, I don't disagree with any of the arguments that were made. Um, I, they're, all, they're all very salient points. Um, I do think Facebook is too big. I think the industry, the data industry, you know, is an oligopoly. Uh, you know, there's a handful of players that have been that have been mentioned, um, and it's very concerning to me. Um, I'm being a little bit non-committal as to whether or not I, I think that it, they should be broken up in the sense that I don't have a personal solution that I can offer to the to the problem. I do feel that I agree that I think Dave has an excellent point that the date, you know, the sort of siloing it to, to kind of think about it. the data I, I give Netflix is, is the data I gave Netflix, the data I give Facebook um, is the data I give Facebook. And that would prevent a lot of that capturing of data that we talked about earlier, where I go off to, you know, to the store or whatever, and someone's gathering data about me, even though I'm not using Facebook. Um, I don't think their ads would work nearly as effectively. I don't think people and I'm not, I'm not trying to defend that at all. I'm, I'm saying they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't like it and, and the, the businesses that, that rely on it wouldn't, wouldn't like it. Um, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, I do feel though that, you know, even the information that I give Facebook, I should have control over that. 
Um, and I think, you know, you know, we hear news reports every once in a while of somebody who got all their data from this service or that service, and they do this deep dive of everything that's ever been known about them. But the amount of effort that you have to go into to get that data and to look through it, you know, what percentage of people are going to do that? It's such a tiny percentage. And in some respects, it's sort of, do I want to look at this? Do I really want to know? Because I might be mortified, you know, or I might be shocked at, at how much data is gathered about me. So um, not too far from where I grew up, um, there are very large data centers that are being built um, in, in land that was once empty. And when you drive by those data centers, and obviously this is, I'm not saying that they belong to Facebook, that it's not clear. It's, there's, the sign doesn't say outside the door whose data it is. But if you're looking for kind of a, a visual, right, when you drive by the business, right, it doesn't say like, this is a Facebook data center. It's just like, this is a data center. <coughs> um, my, it gives you a visual of, you can sort of imagine how much information is in there, right? If this one giant data center that's probably the size of several football fields, and you start to realize that data is what runs our economy. And so I think if you, you know, if, if the plan is to break up a Twitter or, an, or excuse me, a Facebook and uh, spin off Instagram, then I think the data needs to be at the center of the consideration. What is happening to this data, right? If, if Instagram is gone, is my data gonna be siloed over to there? And you can download your data. You can go onto your Alexa and see what it's recorded about your voice. What can you do with that? Not much. What can you do with the fact that Facebook knows that you were in a Target you know, on, on September 1st or whatever it was? Not a whole lot. So I still think the power remains entirely in the hands of the you know, Facebook, Amazon, whomever. Even if we break off these companies, until there's a balance of power that there's media literacy or something about me as a public citizen, what do I do with this information? And now that I've downloaded it, now that I have it, what do I do with it? What do I make use of it? How do I empower myself? And I, I think it's not in the business incentive for, for Facebook or any of these companies to tell you what to do with it or how to make use of it or how you can you know, get rid of it. It's here's your data dump far as I've, I've seen. So um, I'm not trying to be um, against the idea of breaking up um, you know, these, these large companies. I, I just kind of worry of how do we get back to moving back towards some of this data and breaking some of, some of that up and, and some of these other considerations. So I, mean, I just would love to reinforce and, and elaborate a little bit on what, what Dr. Kushner uh, has been saying, because uh, I think there's data, data, and data. And I don't see how we break up companies and offer comp competition to those companies without some form of data portability, because the data that that uh, says you're linked to so and so, who's linked to so and so, that's why you know the, these are drivers for why people show up at all because of the network capabilities. You you know you've invested some little time in creating a, a record with Netflix that may make you feel like, well, do I really wanna, um, you know, supposing some other company were able to get some of, those, uh, some of those contracts as well, do I really want to give that up? So there's, there's data about your, uh, the data that would be absolutely essential for you to want to switch a service, right? Um, I've spent a huge amount of time building up my uh, my uh, uh, Twitter uh, network because it's also, in many ways, my news network. I don't want to have to rebuild that. You know, they will let me. They will let me port over all of my podcasts from iTunes to, to Pocket Casts and from Pocket Pocket Casts anywhere else I want to go. But I can't do that if I'm if I'm uh, you know, leaving Facebook for another social network site. And then there's the data that, that companies gather, not only from your performance on their site, but as, as Dave points out, all of the, the, um, the uh, information harvested, collected, aggregated by data brokers, uh, which 
allows them to know things about you that you don't know about themselves. And that could be stopped by prohibiting that data sharing about you. So those are two different kinds of data that you would need to take action on in order to do some kind of structural regulation about competition. Um, now that we spend some time talking about the company side of it, um, you guys all work on college campuses. Um, I think we need to talk about the what happens to individuals on this. And we got a question from a, a Shepherd University student who's worried about cancel culture and um, the ability for social media companies to quote end careers. Um, there's a real fear out there, particularly a young, among young people who have grown up with all of this. Their whole lives are online. Um, one thing that may, they may not even post themselves, but they may be captured on a phone by a friend making a lewd joke, inappropriate. We know what kids do sometimes. And then boom, they've lost a scholarship and they're never able to walk away from it. Um, are, are you concerned about that? And how does, how does that change how we should maybe teach young people about how to handle this? And should there be perhaps more grace for younger users online? Or is it just, you made your mistakes, hold you to it. As soon as you're online, you're essentially a digital adult. Anybody want to take that? <laughs> I have many thoughts on this and I'm trying to say sure. who goes first. Um, you started the thing about cancel culture, so you have to take it away. <laughs> well, and, well and, he was the one that said he didn't really buy it, which I kind of, yeah, I, well, I'm kind of in that look, I, for what it's worth. I should note that, you know, I, someone did try to cancel me once. Uh, New York Times columnist Brett Stevens uh, didn't like a joke that I told on Twitter and emailed me CCing the provost of my university, uh, trying to dress me down and get me into trouble. Well, um, I won't ask you to retell the joke unless you really want to. Uh, I don't really want to, but um, <laughs> okay. type Brett Stevens into Google, I'm pretty sure it's like the first hit. Okay. Uh, certainly Brett Stevens Twitter. Um, and that, that ended up being sort of a, a week of uh, so, social media was sort of talking about the Brett Stevens incident. And it was interesting coming from him because he's one of the people who decries cancel culture. And then as soon as he, saw, as he saw a thing that he didn't like online, he tried to enact power to, to cause trouble. Didn't work out for him, I'm fine. Um, but that, that's one of the things that I always keep in mind here. So I would start by saying that yes, grace is good. It is a good thing to be offered to young people. It's a good thing to be offered to everybody. I like offering grace to one another is a nice thing in a healthy society. Sure, we should have more of it, that's nice. Um, I would also offer, I would also suggest that I, I think most young people today know that you gotta be a little careful with what you say, what you do, how you present yourself because of context collapse. That a, a What do you mean by that? I haven't heard that phrase before. Oh, context collapse is uh, the idea that something that can seem fine and appropriate in one setting can be weaponized and put in another setting to cause real harm for you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, online, the ability to capture an image and place it in a different uh, context. Uh, the example that I often give to my students um, this was over a decade ago. I used to be on the board of directors of the Sierra Club and I was in my 20s. I was still in graduate school. Uh, and there was a photo that I had posted to MySpace to really uh, date myself. <laughs> I was on that um, back in the day too. Right. So I had posted a photo to MySpace for my friend network of me attending my college reunion, drinking whiskey out of the whiskey bottle. I thought it was hilarious. My friends thought it was hilarious. I felt no shame about this. People found that uh, image online. They felt offended by it for some reason. And they started emailing the Sierra Club, uh, sort of the, the general comms people saying, how dare you have this person engaging in lewd pu public drunkenness uh, for everyone to see? What kind of behavior is this? Out of context, it meant something different to them than it did if you had the context of, hey, this is Dave showing a photo of himself goofing off at his college reunion. I don't think we as a society have any real problem with people drinking with their friends at their college reunions. That's, that's okay. Out of context, it could become something more dangerous. And in particular, the, the thing that I want to raise here, that, that was fine for me because it wasn't a targeted campaign. But what we particularly see post Gamergate in 2015 is targeted campaigns in which malicious strategic actors will find something online and try to set it up to get somebody fire, uh, fired in an effort to, to punish them. We saw this with uh, the director, James Gunn. The, he was the director of the first two um, 
uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movies. He did the recent Suicide, Suicide Squad movie. Uh, he used to be a director for Troma. I think it was Troma Films, which was uh, 90s like horror flicks, like shock value. Um, and he had made a bunch of jokes back in that era on social media. When he spoke out against President Trump, some Trump supporters went and, and trolled back and trolled back and found that stuff and then performed outrage that they didn't genuinely feel to Disney to try to get him fired. He briefly was fired by Disney. He was brought back because both the actors and his fans sort of spoke out and supported him. But that, that wasn't genuine outrage and that wasn't sort of cancel culture silencing people. That was the strategic actors wanting to punish somebody for their political speech. So I do think grace is a good thing. I do think we should be worried about making sure that this strategic coordinated behavior is harder rather than easier because that can have a chilling effect. But I don't think it's a generic cultural phenomenon. I think that what we need to worry about is strategic behavior, not culture. What do you think, Dr. Christian? Do some people deserve to be canceled? If you say bad things online, should you reap the consequences? If your company chooses not to stand by you, if you go too far over the line, and, and what might be the line? Is it is it fair to be targeted by a political campaign if if somebody really screwed up? I, I think that um, we have a right to be forgotten. I'd like to think at some point in our life, That's you know, nice when thought. I'm when I'm <laughs> when I'm gone uh, from from this earth, uh, I'm going to turn over my Facebook account to somebody so that they can delete my account and pull out my data. Um, and I I start kind of lead with that notion because we also I would hope um, can live in a, a civil society where we can learn to forgive others and to understand that somebody was having a drink at a college reunion. Um, and that's a, a normed behavior that, that people engage in. Um, you know, I think some people look at cancel culture as a tool uh, of empowerment when in a situation that they feel that they do not have power through other means. And in that, you know, from that perspective, they may feel that that's justified to sort of cancel or seek to cancel a person or, you know, organization or whatever that they feel have been harmed. But like many things, something becomes a trend or becomes a, a mode of behavior. And, other, and then other people take it as a way to simply try to attack, you know, a public figure or a person, right, for actions that, you know, certainly aren't, aren't warranted. With that said, my thought is that we live in a society that is very un uncivil. We're at a point in time where people are attacking each other over anything. They can't see eye to eye with one another and they can't find middle ground with one another. So I look at you know, the, the tool of cancel, canceling somebody or doxing them as a way to manifest or manifestation of a culture that we live in today that's angry, stressed, loud, bitter, divided. And when you look at other people as your sort of your, you know, your enemy or, you know what I mean? Somebody that, that you need to get out of your way so that you can move forward because they did A or they, they did B or 15 years ago, they said X. Um, I don't think that helps bring people together and I don't think it's productive. So, you know, I think it's, people are gonna debate whether or not they feel that they should be able to cancel others. Being targeted of, of being canceling would be a horrific experience to go through. How we're using it, I think is just another manifestation of the rage and anger that we're living in today. So I don't, I don't, advocate it. I don't believe that people should be doing it. I personally believe that a better way to solve a problem is to sit down and to have a conversation with somebody with whom you disagree to try to understand, you know, their thinking, their behavior, their past actions. It, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that's where we are in society today that, that, um, that we can't do that. Can I offer one counter example? Please. Yeah. So the example that comes to mind for me is um, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville a few years ago, um, where Heather, Heather Heyer was murdered. Um, because there was an effort after that to identify the white nationalists who had, atten who had attended uh, 
and make them stand by their actions. Um, several of them would probably say that they were canceled as a result, that they mm. attended a white nationalist rally. And then afterwards, when people found out that they were vocal white nationalists, that they were drummed out of polite society. Um, and even if we say that in civil, maybe this is uh, my religion speaking for, because I'm, I'm Jewish, so like I feel pretty strongly on this, but good. For us to have, we, we need to have boundaries in society and there need to be things that are outside of those boundaries. And, you know, as a result of them getting drummed out of polite society, the vocal white nationalists are now a little less vocal. I think that is good for a healthy democracy. I think there have to be some boundaries. And so there are cases where I think absolutely let's have more of it. I think absolutely like the, the efforts after the January 6th insurrection to identify people who were posting on social media from January 6th, uh, you know, from storming the Capitol, I think it's probably a good idea to help them be found because it is not a healthy democracy that people can do that and then face no consequences. That gets complicated because then we say, well, where are the boundaries? And it's hard to identify exactly where they are. But certainly once we've reached Charlottesville on January 6th, we can all agree that we're far beyond the boundaries. And so they're somewhere past where we are right now. We're like somewhere in the rearview mirror of where we are right now. Those are on that note, great. I'd be curious to hear from you all what responsibility you think a network such as Twitter or Facebook has when it comes to violent events, whether it be um, the white nationalist rally or January 6th, um, when, when violence is organized on their platforms. Um, of course, there's a right to free speech in assembly, but is there some culpability there? Um, and you could also apply this perhaps to say, you know, the, the, the bleach groups that were advocating bleach as a cure um, for, for COVID that resulted in a lot of calls to poison control and things like that. What, what role do you think uh, the networks have when it comes to those discussions that are happening on their platforms? So I, th I think what you're talking about is misinformation. Sure. Well, yeah, in organizing for uh, potentially political violence, but take your pick of the uh, the harms, <laughs> please. So, and and this goes back to I think to that I lo I loved a word that Dave used, which was weaponizing, and I also really appreciated what what uh, Dr. Cushion was talking about in terms of polarization, and I always want to go back to structures and systems. I want to avoid an individual approach and telling people that they should just behave better uh, because there's some reason, as Dr. Cushion was just pointing out, that people are not doing that <laughs> and they used to do it and something, you know, some things have changed. And one of the, one of the things that has happened is that these platforms have given us new tools, new connections, new um, uh, an, an, an entirely new kind of media that we've been uh, puzzled about how to, how to regulate. Because we do live in a world that in spite of 50 years of deregulation continues to be quite regulated in many ways. You know, we're all wearing seatbelts. The FCC does not allow um, uh, indecent speech. Uh, on, on broadcasts, et cetera. So what we've done is to let these companies get really big on exactly what terms they want to. And the terms they want to are terms that are really, really great for people who are either truly misinformed or much more likely actively interested in misinforming often to the purpose of increasing polarization. So it, it seems to me hopeless to try to say, well, in this circumstance, Facebook should do this rather than, than that, because this is, the, this is the moderation nightmare they're in all the time to, to very little effect. Uh, but it, you have a follow the money problem. Why is it so lucrative for them to not address these problems? You have a structure problem. Why don't we have alternatives to them? And then you could talk about what, what in, in the data problems, but addressing those things would take us, I think, a lot further than trying to decide um, how to, you know, how people, how, how in a targeted instance of, say, treason, 
which is what I would call what, what was going on in, on January 6th, should be, should be dealt with on social media. I wanna, I think one thing I wanna, yes and there. Um, Amanda, in your question, I, I, I wanna divide a piece, which is, I think there is a moral culpability, but not a legal culpability. If I worked at Facebook, then I would be looking at COVID misinformation. I would be looking at uh, like violent insurrection organized through our platform. And I would feel sick and I would say, what can we do to make this better? Because we have the agency to make it better. Legally though, the, the place that we get caught, this is one of the many problems with having such, such quasi monopolies. They are so large that these organizations end up being the platform every, uh, for everything and being forced to make decisions that they are not qualified and don't have the capacity to make. If we broke them up, if there was more competition, then they would have less moral culpability because there's a bunch of competing sites and they could all be trying to compete to create a better civil sphere. But legally, I, like, I wouldn't look at COVID misinformation and say, Facebook is legally to blame. Two th Section 230 is here, it's here for good reasons. Maybe it can be amended at, at the edges, I'm not a law professor. Um, but I, I would say that while I don't think that they're legally culpable and I don't think we should try to make them legally culpable, they have the capacity to change things and so that gives them a, a moral responsibility. Dr. Cushion, is it is it just possible that Facebook is, is too big to even have any hope of moderating itself if it did want to, you know, kind of slow the algorithm so misinformation didn't spread so fast, that's just an idea. Um, perhaps they just can't catch it because there's so much speech, so many connections. That they're not in control of the Frankenstein they, they created. Feel free to agree or disagree with that or just say it's a very ridiculous analogy. <laughs> well, I, I don't think that they can control it. I mean, I, you know, Mark Zuckerberg recommended better algorithms, um, which, you know, uh, you know, for every input, there's an output. Um, Twitter is playing with the idea of, you know, something they call birdwatch, which is sort of a citizen, um, uh, you know, sort of um, relying on the crowd to kind of identify posts and content that are maybe not factual and to provide context to them. Um, and my understanding is that's something that's in testing. I don't think that there's one solution to provide, you know, an algorithm isn't gonna solve our problems um, and crowdsourcing isn't alone gonna solve the problems. I think the companies are too large in that regard. I don't think, you know, Facebook employs, you know, they, they hire, they contract out to other companies to hire people who look at the computer and try to catch and flag and take down content before it spreads too far and those, individuals um, face a lot of mental health issues as a result of the things that people are posting on social media, you know, gruesome things, you know, exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. If you're trying to run these several different, you know, mechanisms to try to moderate this, I think you used the word Frankenstein, this thing that's, that's sort of out of control, um, it's just not possible. I do think that there's a lot of good that can come from trying to empower communities to, to offer some sense of, um, I don't say self-policing, but to, to moderation. Um, but you know, moderating a discussion board and moderating all of Facebook is, is simply, I don't think feasible. But the, the Twitter, for example, and I think other companies, they are successful in taking single shot approaches, banning individuals. So, for example, the former president, Donald Trump, has kicked off Twitter. Um, but then some people point out and say the Taliban is on it. Is that fair? I mean, is it appropriate for Twitter to kick Donald Trump off? Or I guess he's suspended until the board says something or another. Um, who wants to take that one? I mean, they're private companies, right? So long as they're, again, it would work better if we had more competition in the marketplace. Well, let me, let me just offer one thing because this is, has come up a few times. There have been other upstarts attempting to compete with Facebook and Twitter, Gab, Parler. Um, mm -hmm. They're not that successful. And they're, when it comes to, um, you know, if you're looking for people to be talking nicely online, they're not on the right side of the ledger there. So mm -hmm. 
is competition necessarily better because they're creating these platforms because they say Facebook and Twitter censor too much and you can come in here and talk the white nationalist talk and you can come here and organize um, political events where people show up armed at capitals. Um, so I think competition is good. And one of the things that we find is if you get competition, what you're going to find is all the people banned for, from Twitter try to congregate at like parlor. Yep. And then so do FBI agents who want to monitor what they're doing. I don't see a downside there personally, but that sounds good. To, I mean, that, that's not great for that, for the people who are trying to organize the, these activities because they're breaking the law. But again, I'm fine with that personally. Um, getting there, again, I mean, we, we need what Pat has pointed to a few times, we need adversarial interoperability. And by that, what we mean specifically is you can port over your network, even though it's like Facebook is forced to allow you to port over your network, even if you didn't want to. That, that requires policy decisions that are gonna be hard to get through, but it would lead to a better internet than we have right now. And yes, it, it would mean that the white nationalists get to congregate with the other white nationalists. Um, and then other parts of the internet stack. I mean, one of the things that happened, I think it was, it was either Gab or Parler or maybe both, uh, is they were hosted by Amazon's web, serv uh, web services and Amazon said, yeah, we're not gonna host you. That's gonna happen to them too. And then they can go start up their own web hosting com company if they want. They'll, if they are hateful enough, then they're gonna have to move pretty far down the, st down the stack. But that's civil society kind of policing itself against the worst possible ideas. So I, I think if we get competition, a lot of these problems, they don't go away, but they become more tractable than they are now. And I think, I think um, competition is uh, only possible if you have a collection of things, including that. I love this phrase that Dave used, adversarial interoperability. It took me so long to say that, learn how to say that, but it's, it's a really good, it's a really good phrase. Cory uh, Doctorow, I didn't make it up. It's Cory Doctorow. He is, what a hero. He's good. But uh, let's just go back to, you know, can Facebook even control this? Facebook can do whatever it wants to. It knows more about why things happen on Facebook than anyone else. And it spends a huge amount of time uh, doing actual serious social science research on it. The Wall Street Journal article last week, uh, series last week was magnificent in using uh, basically whistleblower data to show that they know exactly what happens and their whole job is to bury that information. So, so they could do whatever they want to because they know how it works. They could stop that. So the question is, why don't they? Because it would screw up their business model. So we keep being forced to come back to um, regulation because they're not going to fix the problem that works really well for them. That you can say exactly the same thing for YouTube and the fact that those algorithms that control what they recommend to you to watch take you from innocent children's uh, toy videos to child pornography in, in way too few clicks. You know, and they know that and they're like, they hand ring about it. And they're like, that's really too bad. The problem is they can't figure out how to do something about it that would impinge upon their primary objective of user engagement. Mm -hmm. So they're not gonna, they're gonna decorate around the edges until somebody makes them. And YouTube, don't forget, owned by Google. So, so th this is where you really come back to the real power of civil society and civil discourse. Because if you can take that tech lash that's going on right now and leverage it to say, we can't live like this anymore and hope for a better future with each other then the place to turn to is federal government and tried and true techniques of regulation, which are not terribly glamorous, but, and they, they're not foolproof. And there is such a thing as agency capture. Yes, all of that is true, but compared to what? Okay, I'm done. Well, that's, I mean, it seems, you know, everybody talks about the need for regulation. Um, I don't know if you all agree with that, but I've 
watched Mark Zuckerberg go before Congress several times and essentially invite Congress, please regulate me, here are my preferred reforms, and still uh, no nothing happens. And so what, what should Congress do? Is this just, you know, you most often hear it discussed in the framework of Section 230 about whether they are uh, platforms or publishers or do we believe these are full monopolies? And I think even that question is debatable. Um, what would be the right course to take and what would you focus on the most? Just as a, just a, a really quick thought, um, it's hard to regulate something you don't understand. Yep. <laughs> um, so, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg asks, uh, you know, the, the government to, uh, to regulate and they're not regulating, it might be because uh, there's a balance of power there in terms of, you know, the, the being up to speed on how the technology works and having the engineers and, um, and all of the folks that make Facebook and then, you know, sort of Congress and, um, you know, and, and, and what, what they're up to speed on and as it relates to how all this technology works, what's going on behind the scenes. And the point was made earlier that there isn't a, a great deal of transparency so there's not a great deal of understanding. So it, I think it's, I'm pure speculation, but I imagine it's hard for, for the government to take action when I would say the balance of power is, is a, much more to the side of uh, big tech than it is to, um, to the government in terms of their understanding of, of what's going on and how this works. That's, that, that's my assumption. So, well, and let me say, what a nice person you are, Dr. Cushion, because I, I do think that there's a ton of ignorance around very basic things about how these companies work, both technically and economically. That's true. And then there's also bad faith. Uh, so Section 230 is the part of um, what is now the Telecommunications Act that, that says companies um, have a freedom from the same liability that uh, applies to a user for things that users do on their platforms. Like they can't be sued for copyright violations that somebody else makes. But that doesn't mean that they can't moderate. So it's a really important part of the law that makes the current internet function. Uh, we actually just did a study, uh, Aram Sinreich and I uh, just uh, completed a study that we're about to uh, 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 release at a conference, looking at, and God help me, every single piece of 230 legislation since 2017. And overwhelmingly, this legislation is not legislation that is intended to actually be legislation. It's intended to send a message to the base that you're furious at the platforms for the reason that your base is furious with the platforms. And they're written in a way that is so tacky and, un, and unusable that nobody is ever gonna, they're not even gonna get out of committee, but they're sent up just as a flag that then of course, Breitbart and Fox pick up and create into like the latest, the latest thing. Uh, so I think there's a lot of bad faith around the discussion in two, uh, of 230, which is a shame for the general public. Again, completely weaponized, designed to activate a political base for other purposes. And what it's doing in the, in, along the way is confusing people completely about what's the problem with the internet. You know, so it's it's a really good example of how civil society is being uh, driven into polarization by a weaponized tactics around both tech lash around the social platforms um, and a failure to understand regulation. But I also agree with Dr. Cushion that there's a lot of ignorance. Well, let's stay with this just for a little bit, because um, this is a question I want to get to before we wrap up. Um, does the status quo or maybe lack of regulation favor um, a political side, the left or the right? Not, not really, honestly. Um, the, the one thing that I want to add into the mix is there's an, old mix, there's an old sort of myth that had more truth to it back in the 1990s, even the 1980s, um, that the internet was changing too fast to regulate. Um, well, now. Zuckerberg <laughs> is now telling us, yes, regulate me. And then he's saying, oh, wait, no, not like that. Which again, I study strategic political communication, like hats <laughs> off, that is a very standard playbook and you're delivering it well. 
Um, but he's also then coming and saying, well, you can't regulate us too much because then Chinese companies will, will become the dominant players. And he's also saying you can't regulate us because we're about to have these breakthroughs in the metaverse and in uh, cryptocurrency and in, in uh, AI and in machine learning, which are so big that you, you can't regulate us because we're just figuring out what it is. Um, I did a study uh, just a few years ago. I read uh, chronologically <clears throat> the entire back catalog of Wired Magazine, 25 years. Um, fun, this is you know, what academics with tenure do for fun. Um, and one of the things that stood out to me is it was true in the 1990s that every three, five years, the internet was pretty radically different than the internet of five years earlier. And that is not the case anymore. The internet of 2021 is pretty much, pretty strongly resembles the internet of 2011. It is still Amazon, Facebook, Apple, uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, with Twitter in there, not as a huge company, but as huge on social media. Um, it's the same companies. We have had tremendous stability for a decade. And that means that when these internet companies come to us and say, look, you can't regulate big tech because you will destroy innovation. I think the appropriate response from regulators is, you know, it's been the same companies having these same conversations for 10 years. <laughs> We're caught up. Now, that does not mean that, uh, you know, an 80 year old senator is going to be fully up to speed with every nuance of machine learning. But I do trust Lena Khan and Tim Wu and the, and the FCC uh, and the FTC to actually catch up with us. You know, you can hire some pretty talented lawyers for the DOJ who are up to speed on the past 10 years of digital infrastructure, which means I think we can be comfortable calling for regulation now in a way that we were fairly uncomfortable 20 years ago because the internet is changing at a much slower pace than it used to. Dr. Christian, thoughts? Um, I think that's a great point. I mean, I do think, yeah, the internet itself as our daily experience, I mean, I'm getting on Facebook, I was 10 years ago, um, is changing. Um, you know, where are things going with AI and virtual reality and so forth? I think things are going to move. How is that going to go? You know, it's difficult to say. I, I agree with Dave. I, I think that's a great point. Well, as we wrap this up before David comes in to close us out, I want to ask you all one last question. Um, we'll go in the same order as we did at the top. And it's very simple. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of society given what is happening on social media? Am I sleeping well tonight or am I staying up? What is it? Um, yes. Dr. Afrahida, we'll take you first and Dr. Carf and Dr. Cushion, please. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, that was okay. <laughs> well, that is great. Well, why? Why is that? Is because you think the government is going to take a role, and there will no, be I think, I think, regulation, I think, and it'll fix everything. I think there's plenty to be worried about. Sure. I'm saying yes to both things. Okay. Um, there's plenty to be worried about. We live in a surveillance society that's utterly uncontrolled and run by private companies that have no obligation to consider the public. Or the or the uh, or or uh, civic discourse or the public sphere or the future of this society. Okay, actually, let me take one add on to this question: What social platforms are each of you on, and are there any that you will not be on? Oh, so I'm not on any Facebook platform. No, oh, me neither. <laughs> there you go. Um, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference to anybody because, as everybody knows, the. Facebook is still able to garner huge amounts of information about me and uh, the entire rest of the world is on Facebook. So, but I'm not. Anyway, so to continue, I think we are dealing with these gigantic commercial juggernauts that are a really uh, a feature, a structuring feature of our lives and worth paying the most serious attention to. And I'm also optimistic at the moment about an administration that takes the, the challenge of regulation seriously and has introduced into uh, government uh, very, very competent people who are very responsible. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna preview an essay that I'm working on now, which is there is a lot of talk from Silicon Valley right now about three versions of the future. Um, there's, they, they talk a lot about cryptocurrency and blockchain. They talk a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And recently they're talking a lot about the metaverse. 
Um, that one freaks not me out. Not talking about a, a fourth future, though. Every once in a while, it gets it gets mentioned briefly, which is uh, climate. Um, and related to that, while I, I think if I had a time machine and I could, could go back to 2011, I think 2011 me would be first shocked at the stability of the internet, how, how similar the internet of 2021 is to, to today. So again, that's the slowdown of internet time. And then I would tell him about, oh, also on January 6, 2021, uh, there was an insurrection at the Capitol. And he would say, I'm sorry, what? So I am um, deeply pessimistic not because of the internet and social media, but because I think that the social problems that we are facing are getting worse. And while social media isn't the cause of it, it's an accelerant and it could be helping a lot more than it is. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of dangers in our future from climate and from political instability. And hearing billionaires from Silicon Valley instead talk about escaping, from, escaping to space or escaping to the metaverse, uh, leaves me deeply pessimistic for my small children and the world they're inheriting. And what platforms are you on or do you refuse to be on? I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, I have a Facebook account, but I don't use it anymore because I find them gross. Um, and also I just don't find it very appealing. Um, and occasionally I look at a YouTube video, but really Twitter is where I spend my time. Dr. Christian? Um, certainly a lot to be concerned about, um, as has been mentioned. So I'll just try to go with one, like add something positive to the, to the conversation, <laughs> because I think there's, you know, we, we've talked a lot about a lot, a lot of concerns. Um, 10 years ago, I maybe would have called myself, a, you know, an optimist of, of technology. I certainly would not consider myself to be, but putting that aside, um, I think, you know, some things that we didn't really get into as much include some of the positives that have come in terms of, you know, shedding light on things that are happening in society and around the world and, and providing that information. Um, you know, um, Charlottesville was brought up, um, January 6th was brought up, but also, you know, police brutality, all kinds of things that, you know, we'd like to think that technology can be a tool for democratization, that you can give, or that, you know, everybody can have the opportunity to provide evidence of or to share information of something that's happened. And we used to talk about sort of citizen journalism um, and, and that this was going to kind of bring light to things. I think a, a lot of information has been put out there through these types of actions that we can uncover, that we can share. And I would like to think, although I'm pessimistic about a lot of things, I would like to think that some good in society has come from our ability to shed light on things that people may not have otherwise known about. And so despite all you know, that, that we are concerned about, I'd like to think that there are moments in time that have light has been shown on something and that has hopefully for the better, you know, moved the needle, so to speak. Um, but I do think there's a, a great deal of, of challenges. Um, and I guess sort of the last thing I say is, you know, I, I grew up on a, on a computer, <laughs> uh, you know, the first computer that I had, I mean, I was real little, my dad had it, but when I was getting into it, it was a Packard Bell 486. And I thought the internet and the computers were the greatest thing that had ever happened. And I look at where things are now and, and I do kind of wonder, you know, did it have to turn out this way? Is the internet that we have today, was that an inevitability? Um, are those market forces that brought that forward? You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things we could go on and on about, um, but I don't think it was inevitable that we got to where we are today, but I don't know what that reality would have been and I sure would have liked to have seen it. Um, I am on Facebook, not very often. I am on Instagram occasionally, Twitter occasionally, LinkedIn occasionally. I, I really, over the past several months, tried to, to detox a, a bit. Well, great. Well, I think the internet is still a net good. It brought us all together here tonight. It will be a, a, a test of Facebook's moderation. I think this was live streamed on Facebook and that is nice given how critical we were of Facebook while we were on the Facebook live stream. But now I will hand it over to David Welch. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amanda. By the way, I wanna just share my favorite uh, quote from the night. It was only on chat and it was, Patricia's that says, uh oh, my kid is locked out. Gotta <laughs> open the door. In case you missed that one, that was uh, 
But uh, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for tonight's excellent forum. Uh, Patricia Onderheide, uh, Dave Karp, and Matt Cushion, as well as our outstanding moderator, Amanda Carpenter. I also wish to thank our producer, Sarah Burke, for organizing this and putting this together. I hope you will put on your calendars the evening of November 17th, where we will show a new documentary uh, entitled The First Step. It's hosted by Van Jones, the producers of this important film, Brandon and Lance Kramer, as well as some of the people in the film will be on hand here at Shepherd to present their work and answer questions. We are hopeful it will be our first totally live event since March of 2020. Again, uh, this forum was great. Uh, this is an example of what we get to do with a topic, an important topic, when we have great people and 90 minutes to talk about it. Somehow that's a lot more appealing to me than a 30 second soundbite on uh, the evening cable news. Meanwhile, farewell, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening, and we hope to see you soon.